Welcome to the Warriors of Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. Warriors of Grace is about helping men from generation to generation become gospel men in private, in the home, in the church, and in public through the Word of God. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. guys well welcome back to the warriors of grace podcast my name is dave and i'm the host for this podcast and today we continue our series through the book of titus looking today at uh, titus 2 1 through 2 and verses 6 through 8 so hear what the word of the lord has to say to us in titus 2 1 through 2 and verses 6 8 through 8 So Titus 2, 1 through 2 says, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be... uh, Oops, verse 2. Verses 6 through 8 say this, Likewise, urge the the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity uh, dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent uh, may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us so this is uh, where we're going to look at today in 1990 bill mccartney the he- then the head football coach for the university of Colo- colorado led the first meeting of promise keepers which was an organization to to build up godly christian men according to its website promise keepers aims to introduce men and young adults to jesus as their savior and challenge them to be men of the word godly husbands and fathers live a life of purity and support their pastors and starting with 72 men at the first meeting promise keepers would gather 7 million men over the next 25 years including an estimated 800,000 for its 1997 stand in the gap gathering at the national mall in washington dc at its height, the massive stadium gatherings hosted by Promise Keepers demonstrated the need for godly manhood to be emphasized in society and the church. Now, the importance of growing godly men is stressed in the second chapter of Titus. Having urged his disciple Titus to oppose false teaching in chapter 1, Paul advances in chapter 2 to teach his people how to behave as men. And we're also going to talk about women in Titus 2, 1 through 8, the apostle gives instruction for the conduct of older men, older women, younger women, and younger men. And as Paul sees it, practical godliness is essential, not only to the life of believers, but also to the witness of the church. Ever aware that the fledging church on Crete is opposed from without and challenged from within, Paul directs Titus to promote a wholesome godliness Titus 2.8 says, So that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Now Paul begins with urging Titus to teach what accords with sound doctrine in Titus 2.8. And in the previous section, he combated the false teaching of the defiled and the unbelieving enemies of the gospel in Titus 1.15. The lifestyle teaching that follows shows the definite link between sound doctrine and and godly living and at the same time we need to observe that the bible's teaching about manhood and even womanhood is itself doctrine and many christians hold the false view that that while it is vital for us to believe in jesus and even receive the bible's teaching on salvation (coughs) it's pre (coughs) it's precepts for men and women are more negotiable Yet the clear and even the insistent teaching of the New Testament on gender idea, identity, marital relations, even sexual conduct, it, it carries the same divine authority as its teaching on justification. And so all passages such as Titus 2 present what accords with sound doctrine, its message for men and women is itself essential theology for a faithful Christian life. And for a man to neglect his masculine calling or a woman to reject her feminine identity is to, defy, uh, is to defy the obedience to which every follower of Jesus is summoned. And equally important is the obligation uh, of every believer to cultivate God's grace 
in his character. Hayne Griffin says, To be rescued from sin and death through faith in Jesus Christ must result in a changed life that displays self-control and reflects God's love and God's grace. The emphasis in Titus 2.1 is placed on the word you, but as for you. And Titus played a key role as a pastor of the Christian church, and it was essential that he opposed false teachers. Titus was in the business of promoting healthy Christianity, and the word sound appears three times in verses 1 through 10. His calling, like that of pastors today, was not to attract large numbers by his own clever marketing, but was to produce sound believers who were well instructed in biblical truth. For this reason, he was to speak, speak out. Paul insisted that Titus teach the biblical way of salvation and also speak about what makes for a sound and healthy uh, Christian church and life. And it's fitting that, that Paul begins with instructions for older men who are the natural leaders of any Christian community. An older man would be 50 years or older. And we're not surprised that Paul's demands for such men are similar to those given in chapter 1 for church elders, since it would be from among the older men that most elders were called. And whereas in secular culture, older men were venerated for their age, in the church they were to be respected for their character. Paul's definition of a healthy older man begins with three characteristics. First, an older man is to be sober-minded, verse 2. And the root form of the Greek nepalos means to be free from intoxication. Even non-believers saw that something was unseemly when an older man disgraced himself through drunken behavior. And how much more true was this for an older Christian man? In the folly of youth, one might not even realize the pleasures of overindulgence are not worth the cost. But you see, an older man should have long since learned this lesson. And more broadly, an older man should be sober-minded about all of life. He should be able to appreciate the true value of all things and have a sense of proportion. Sober-mindedness would exclude a seasoned Christian from neglecting his family for the sake of a job promotion. It would keep a younger man from recklessness of greed. John MacArthur says this, his priorities are in the right order and he is satisfied with fewer and even simpler things. And second, Paul desires older men to be dignified. The, the Greek word simios means worthy of respect, noble, or even grave. This does not mean that an older, older men cannot exhibit a sense of humor or that they must be serious at all times. But it does urge older men to carry themselves with gravitas. There must be a weightiness to their lives that comes from long fellowship with God. An older man knows the stakes in his life along with its perils, and he speaks and he acts with a serious purpose that impacts other people's lives. And while his physical powers may have diminished, yet he has the valuable resource of experience. What Cicero wrote of the Roman gender, uh, general Quintus Fabius Maximus should be true of older Christian men. There was about the man a seriousness seasoned with courtesy and old age brought no alteration to his conduct. And how different is the Bible's view of old age compared to that of Western society today? Many Americans look forward to a time in their senior years where they can just focus on themselves and their ambitions. But the Christian does not see their senior years as, as one last chance for fun before dying. Rather, he knows that eternity draws near in the joyful rest of heaven with the Lord Jesus. And, and while he lives, the godly older man wants to leverage his experience and his relationships to make as big an impact for the glory of God as possible, and especially to lead young people to faith in Jesus. Churches should look on their seniors not as has-beens who are washed up, rather Rather, rather, they should use them, and young people should see older godly men as a vital resource to be used and even valued and respected and, and to learn from. Well, third, older men must be self-controlled. Paul uses the same term as specifying the qualification for church elders in Titus 1.8. In fact, Paul used the same term in specifying uh, the respect that should be sensible and even discreet. The idea is not so much of resisting impulses as it's just exercising general good judgment. 
This quality was essential in a community known for liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, as we looked at in chapter 1, verse 12. And the term will occur a third time in Titus 2, uh, 2.12, where Paul sees a discerning self-control as a mark of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And having summarized the effects of a mature godliness as sober-minded, dignified, and self-controlled, Paul concludes with a portrait of spiritual soundness to which older men should aspire. They should be sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness, Titus 2.2. 2. In Paul's language of spiritual soundness, it reminds us of the Bible's frequent use of the tree as a metaphor of the godly life. Matthew 12.33, Jesus said that the tree is known by its fruit. An apple tree is identified by its apples, a lemon tree by its lemons, and so on and so forth. And likewise, an older Christian man is known by his spiritual health. Psalm 1 describes the effects of a, of a Christian spirituality in similar terms. In Psalm 1-3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And to some people, the idea of Christians becoming oaks of righteousness as Isaiah 61 3, it smacks of a triumphant legalism that denies the debilitating effects of sin throughout our lives. But Psalm 1, it shows how spiritual fruitfulness is, is not only possible, but how it actually happens. And it begins with, with the good judgment not to follow the intellectual fashions of the time. Psalm 1 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. It, it includes shunning ungodly habits so as not to ruin one's profession of faith. And, it, and Psalm 1, 1 continues, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So a man will grow in godly stature and fruit throughout a life that is devoted to the study and even the meditation of God's word. Psalm 1, 2 says, his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And now Paul sees this, this sound and healthy Christian maturity demonstrated in three foundational commitments in Titus 2.2, 2, saying, in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. And this list, it mirrors Paul's similar statements in 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, now faith, hope, and love abide. And so a, a mature, a godly man must be sound in faith. And we may see this quality both objectively and subjectively. Objectively, a man must learn sound doctrine from the Bible so that he understands God, man's sin, and salvation. He must be able to detect false teaching that would cripple his life. And above all, he must know that faith in Jesus is the only way of salvation since Christ alone has gained the forgiveness of our sins. And subjectively, he must have been trained in the exercise of faith, having learned through experience the value of trusting in a God who has proved to be faithful. Godly men should be sound in love. Their, their hearts have grown fixed to their families, to the church, and to, above all, a longing desire for God. These healthy loves are joined to a corresponding hatred of sin and evil, and a loving soundness will keep older men from a critical spirit that insists on finding fault, and instead, experience should make them more sympathetic to the struggles of the young, more tolerant, of honest mistakes and even more charitable towards differing opinions among believers. In fact, finally, godly health will be exhibited by sound uh, steadfastness. And so this third quality, it takes the place of hope in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And the two are very closely linked. As we grow closer to the end of life, a Christian should think more often about heaven and the glory of Jesus. We should cultivate a spiritual joy that translates into an abiding spiritual purpose. Haynes Griffin comments, The latter years of life, especially for men, can be filled with regrets, a sense of uselessness or worthlessness, <coughs> even feelings of despair, self-absorption, or even a tendency to relax moral standards because of old age. And yet Paul calls for older men what he desired for himself as he approached the end of life, to have fought the good fight, to have finished the race, to have kept the faith. And so a biblical model for male Maturity is provided in, in the example and life of Caleb, Joshua's partner, and one of the two believing spies who went ahead of Israel into the Promised Land. This great achievement came in Caleb's middle age. And yet 45 years after a signature achievement, 85-year-old Caleb asked Moses that he be given one of the more difficult assignments in capturing Canaan. 
in Joshua 14, 11, I am still uh, as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me, he insisted. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. Not many men of Caleb's age can boast of retaining the physical vigor of youth. But far from retreating into self-enclosed retirement, older men re remain in action through prayer, through Bible reading, and the mentoring of young men in the local church. And it's obvious that Paul's teaching about older men that, that younger men should watch and learn from the good example of their seniors. And for these younger men, Paul focused on a single key virtue in verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Like its use in Titus 2.2, 2, the great... The Greek word translated self-control means to have a godly understanding of practical matters so as to act soundly. Paul's constant emphasis on this discerning mind, it shows that biblical knowledge and biblical wisdom are the key to all godliness. And this discerning mind shows that biblical knowledge and even biblical wisdom are the key to all godliness. In this, he follows the precept of Solomon in Proverbs 4.23, Guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the issues of life. The, you see, the start of discernment will be the knowledge of who God is and what God is like, and how essential it is for young men to be fortified with the promises of the Bible, which offer blessing for those who follow Jesus. John 8.12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now notice the connection between seeing in the light of Christ's revelation of God and the lifestyle of a disciple. At the foundation of a young man's godly life, we, we find the knowledge of God's love and the grace that gives salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. And, and as they gain godly discernment, beginning with the truths of Scripture, young men must then apply those truths towards a godly and a balanced lifestyle. We are living in a generation that encourages young men to avoid responsibility and even in early adulthood to shun the commitments of a mature life. And with this attitude, young, young adult men often defer marriage despite the Bible's teaching in Genesis 2.18 that it is not good that a man should be alone. Instead of training themselves for useful roles in society, many young men cling to the skirts of their parents and indulge in a life of video games and even sinful self-indulgence. Paul would have young men think and act differently. Tim Chester is right when he says young men need to grow up to take life seriously, to take their faith seriously, and be responsible. Instead of indulging sexual sins, abusing alcohol, or even getting addicted to technology, young men should be guarding their hearts and learning a, a, a practical godliness that will flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, as 2 Timothy 2.22 says. William Barclay, he notes rightly three ways in which godly self-control is, is especially important for young men, saying this, uh, First, their blood runs hotter and their passions speak more commandedly to their sinful nature. And so the only way to avoid the tide pool of sin is for young men to cultivate positive godly character. And second, young people generally have more opportunities to go in bad directions. They interact with ungodly influences whose siren song bids them to make a shipwreck of their faith. And lacking the responsibility of a more, more mature life, they can foolishly reason that a little dabbling in sin will do no permanent harm. But how wrong this is. Psalm 1, it notes the progression. Those who listen to the counsel of the wicked will stand in the way of sinners and in the end will sit in the seat of scoffers. And this will all happen because they took advantage of, of youth's opportunity to heed bad counsel. Third, young men have not yet learned the harsh lessons of experience. Barclay says this, In almost every sphere of life, a young person will be more reckless than his elders for the simple reason that he has not yet discovered all the things which can go wrong. And in light of all the perils that lay in wait uh, for the wayward feet of young men that godly counsel is for them to kneel in prayer and sit quietly before God's word, gaining a discerning character that practices self-control. The 33, the 30 year old Julius Caesar once came upon a statue of Alexander the Great and he grieved over what Alexander had achieved at the same age, whereas Caesar had pursued self-indulgence. And reforming his life, Caesar went on to become a second Alexander, not only a great general, but also the source of the line of Roman emperors who would bear his name. 
And this is how a godless pagan responds to his youthful folly. How much more ought Christians, men, to look on the lives of fellow believers who have accomplished great things for the Lord Jesus and be motivated towards godly change? 1 Timothy 4.12 uh, highlights this when it says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And so the church and Christian parents should set high standards for young men, both expecting and giving them the opportunity to exhibit godly manhood that will bless the people of God. And, and given the ungodly environment in which Titus ministered, Paul expects this young pastor to take a leading role in, in growing godly young men in the church. Paul's strategy was for Titus both to show and to speak so that young men in the congregation would have a model of good works, Titus uh, 2.7 tells us. You see, experience shows us that most people learn best uh, by watching others. And for this reason, Titus must realize that his life was on display before the whole church and especially for the impressionable young men. In fact, the Greek word for model is tupos, meaning uh, to, to referring to a die that leaves its mark on the object when it's struck. And so it's clear that Titus, who was himself the age of the young men whom he was to impress and to minister, was to interact with them and make an impact on their lives. And while Titus could never be perfect, there was to be a consistency between his life and his doctrine and his teaching that would encourage other men to follow. And by his ministry, the men of this church would be taught, but by Titus' godliness, an example or model would be caught. And this is not to say that Titus' teaching was of little importance. In fact, in verses 7-8, through 8, Paul says this to Titus, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. And what this emphasizes and it shows is that the great mistake is made when young men are treated as children so they, they're not expected to learn the doctrine of Scripture or salvation or even anything about godly living or theology. In fact, many churches even cater the entire worship service to a youthful style so that instead of urging the young to grow up, the whole church becomes immature. Titus was to teach God's word with integrity towards the scriptures, with dignity that benefits so vital a ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, his speech, that is his regular way of talking and even interacting with people, was to exhibit a godly maturity that would encourage young men to follow suit. A wise minister to young men might, will therefore speak frequently about Jesus Christ. He will remind his hearers of the blessing that comes from trusting Christ as Savior and the privilege of serving so great a Lord. And what a challenging task it was that Paul set before his young disciple. The apostle's high standard shows that ministers in general and even young ones need the prayer of God's people to enable them both to live and to speak a godly example. Barclay says this, It must be true of him as it was of Chaucer's saintly person, but Christ's love and his apostles' twelve, he taught, but first he followed it himself. It is probably the case that a special burden rested on Titus to guide the young men because the older men on Crete still needed to grow in basic life and doctrine and godliness. And yet, in more mature churches, the burden of impacting young men, it falls on the older men, not just the pastor. Fathers especially should labor to have an impact on their children. That the great missionary John Patton felt from his own godly father, Patton caught his passion to take the gospel to the primitive new hybrid islands because of the passionate prayers that his father uttered at the family table. And when Patton finally departed for this calling, which would likely have taken him from home for the rest of his life, he received a special blessing in parting from his father. He later wrote of how his father had walked with me the first six miles of the way for the last half mile or so. We walked together in almost unbroken silence. His lips kept moving in silent prayers for me, and his tears fell fast when our eyes met each other in looks for which all speech was vain, he says. We halted on the reaching, the appointing, parting place. He grasped my hand firmly for a minute in silence and then solemnly and affectionately said, God bless you, my son. Your father's God prosper you and keep you from all evil. Unable to say any more, his lips kept moving in silent prayer and tears we embraced and parted, he says. 
It is such words of blessing that Christians should speak, especially on special occasions when reminded of the rich grace of God. In fact, Patton later testified that the memory of that scene not only helped by God's grace to keep me pure from the prevailing sins, but it also simulated me in my studies that I might not fall short of his hopes and in all my Christian duties that I might faithfully follow his shining example. And there are many reasons why, why Christian men both old and young should cultivate the godly virtues emphasized by paul god has invested greatly in their lives sending his own son jesus to die for their sins on the cross and sending the holy spirit into their hearts the years that a man spends on earth are as valuable today as they were in the time of joshua or caleb or or paul and titus and whoever a christian knows that the legacy of our short lives on earth will resound in eternity and that our good works and our gospel labor will lead to God's eternal praise. And so Paul concludes with a special reason why Titus should invest himself so carefully among the men of his church, setting a sound example in in, in deeds and in speech so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing to evil to say about us, Titus 2.8. See, Paul knew all too well that a, that a pastor is subject, subjected to persistent and even often critical scru- scrutiny so that Titus would need to be especially careful about his teaching and his manner of living. But even worse still, many surrounding the the church were seeking an opportunity to disgrace not only Titus, but also Paul. And notice what Paul says, that opponents uh, would speak evil about us. And so every Christian man should therefore realize that his life represents those who are associated with him, his, his family, his church, and even his pastor. And more importantly, every believing man bears the name Christian. And therefore, our manner of living and our speaking will reflect on the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ in the eyes of a scoffing world. Our character and our lifestyle matters for many reasons. But chief among them is the calling and even the obligation that Christians have to represent the Lord Jesus. How tragic it is today if it it, it would be if if something we did or even, even said gave sinners a reason to turn from faith in Jesus Christ. And how great it is the blessing when the evidence of our lives prompts an unbeliever to consider the state of his or her own soul. In fact, Jesus gave uh, this matter a pressing concern for all of his followers in Matthew 5, 14-16, which says, You are the light of the world, and so let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Men, I want to encourage you, find that older man in your life. Let him invest in you. If you're younger, let him speak into your life. You don't have to take everything that he says as, as gospel truth, but you need to hear the, the, the wisdom of, of older men. You need them in your life. You need to hear what they have to say, and you need to take their counsel very seriously. So I encourage you to find an older man and to grow uh, learn from him. Learn all that you can about you know what what what's to come in your life. It, it, things that you face. Be honest about what you're facing. Uh, though I find that the more I do that, guess what? <laughs> the more I'm growing, and the more I'm able to face life, and, and uh, the more that I'm going to be a godly example to those who are who are younger than me, and maybe even older, who who are helped through the ministry of servants of grace. So. I want to commend this to you. It is vital. We're going to come back to this and talk about it many more times. So I want to thank you guys for listening or watching this episode of the Warriors of Grace podcast. Until next time, God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Warriors of Grace podcast. If you enjoyed the show today, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you want to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or search Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find our show on the front page of the website, servantsofgrace.org.